Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to Michelle Dreyer about her series, the Stained Glass Mystery Series. This book is Stain on the Soul. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad you're here as well. So let me give a little bio information on Michelle. She is a fifth generation Californian and has lived all over the state from Humboldt County in the north to Riverside County in the south. She was born in Santa Cruz and raised primarily in the Bay Area. During her career in journalism at Daily Newspapers in California, she won awards for her investigative series. She is the past president of Capital Crimes, a Sisters in Crime chapter, and the Guppies chapter of Sisters in Crime, and she is the current vice president of NorCal Sisters in Crime, and she has co-chaired VoucherCon. So there aren't many things that Michelle hasn't done. (laughs) Very many. (laughs) We've had a long and varied life. Oh, and that's, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think the fact, because I lived in a bunch of different places in my life, uh, even within a city, I moved yeah. like every third week I lived in Miami, I think I was moving to a new place to live. It, it was, but it, I'm a, I'm a person that can adapt. And I assume you must be the same way because that you can't move often and not be able to adapt. I think that's very true. It seems to me I counted at one point I went to eight different schools before I graduated from high school. Now, oddly enough, I'm in Sacramento now, and I've been here almost 25 years, which is by far the longest I've lived anywhere in my life and probably will stay. Just All right. Know. So yes. now, so you do live in San, Sacramento now, but yeah. is there a favorite place that you've loved more than any other place that you lived? Well, I have to tell you for the, beauty of it humboldt county it's it's sad in some ways because the economic base is so bad but it's an absolutely gorgeous place and i was surprised when i moved to riverside i had lived in southern california before and at first i thought oh my god this is just barren but i i learned to really appreciate (laughs) the beauty of the desert it's it's very it's very subtle but it's very very nice and there are parts of of southern california that i miss dreadfully yeah there's a there's a pace down there that i like there is uh you know and for people who don't know california is a unique place we don't have a governor's mansion in sacramento i think there's only two states that doesn't have a governor's mansion and we're one of them and one of the largest states in the nation so it's crazy but sacramento has a very different vibe and charm all on its own just like with Riverside, I think you have to look for it a little bit. I think so. And in a bizarre way, I think Sacramento is probably the perfect capital for a, for a state like California because it's small enough where, I don't know, six, seven hundred thousand, you know, it's a city. And the metro area is about two million. But it's it's got enough, not rural, a small town rural feel to it. Mm-hmm. as well as enough glitz that people from L.A. can come up and not feel out of, out of sight. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, or for San Francisco, you know, you get, we well, That's San Francisco right. kind of looks down on us, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's got a little bit of, of urban glamour to it, and it's getting more. It does, and I think every time I've been back to Sacramento, I think I see that it has a little more, and a little more, upscale because i know the first time i went to sacramento and i know everybody's not interested in hearing all about my trip to sacramento but i remember the first time i went i was like oh my this was very jarring at that point i felt like the percentage of unhoused people rivaled los angeles but on my subsequent trips i've noticed that it's it seems to be faring a lot better than los angeles i i think it is yeah i think it is it's um there, there are problems, obviously, and uh, our, current, our current mayor, who was ending his second term, was the um, Senate pro, leader, Senate pro tem of the state Senate. So, so there's a lot of political stuff. Obviously, politics is probably the income generator here in this area, but it's getting it's getting a nice. A, a nice glitz to it. You know, there's some really good restaurants. There's some really good shops. They're working on the waterfront, all these positive things. Yeah. 
It's a good thing. I know when a friend of mine and I were there, we ate at a restaurant downtown that I will I will say this unequivocally. It's the best meal I've had in the last year of my life. Wow. And that's I, and anybody who knows me knows that I go out to eat a lot. So uh, yeah. it, but it was really quite magical. So let's talk about uh, Staying on the Soul. So this is the okay. first of the Stained Glass Mystery books. Is that correct? That is correct. There are three of, three of them now. All right. Can you give us give the audience a little overview about what this book is about? Sure. Um, the the series, my all my writing is character based, obviously, rather than plot driven. And this this series is about a stained glass artist, which seems like a kind of different career. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was designed as, as a as a somewhat of a cozy. So she's a stained glass, but she's an internationally known stained glass artist. And she does massive installation pieces in malls and huge homes and cathedrals and all. Yeah. And she and her husband, Winston, live in LA. He's the uh, art historian for UCLA. And he's killed in a drive-by shooting. And she's gone, oh my God. And the cops, because she obviously is the person of interest, are there all the time. So she decides to move. She takes everything she owns, moves to a little tiny town on the coast of Oregon, where she is pursuing, you know, healing herself, <clears throat> pursuing this thing. She takes her dog for a walk one day and comes out and their whole street, which isn't very large, is red and blue, you know, and she's going, what? And she looks across the street and somebody is being carried out in a body bag and she looks a little closer. And for those of you who write police procedurals, there's a reason that it is like this. She's her one of her caming knives, the knives that she used to cut, is in a plastic bag. It's the murder weapon. And so she's going, oh, OK, so she hooks up with another neighbor who is actually a an author and a newspaper man. And they set out to figure out who killed. Well, first of all, who is this person? Because his deed for the house was in the name of a diocese. So it was somehow the church was involved. And why was he killed? And so as they investigate, you learn more and more about the small town and more and more about um Roz, her name is Rosalind Duke, and more and more about Liam, who's, you know, um, but there's, there's a, I don't know, switcheroo, turns out that the man who was murdered is a defrock priest, so there is, um, there's pedophilia in the church in that, and that, and there's a very, very nasty bad guy who's, you know, much, much larger than that, but I thought, you know, this is, this is true, I mean, it's not true, they're, every single one of my books, whether they're any of the mysteries or whether they're the um, Kandinsky Vampire Chronicles, and I'd like to talk a little bit about those at some yes. point, um, have a germ of realness in them, I would say. Mm -hmm. not, not truth necessarily, but realness. And in this case, you know, I started looking into, well, I got really intrigued with the movie Spotlight. I don't know if you've seen that. The Boston Globe reporter yes. to yes. uncover. Yeah. And I just, that is so astounding, particularly as, as having been a journalist. That's a beautiful movie and a wonderful job that they, you know, and I thought this is, this is not a problem that's going away. It still mm -hmm. exists. And so that's, and that's a, an enormous reason for being killed, obviously. Um, and then the second one in the book is actually set on the coast of England. She gives herself some time. She's taken a commission to do, the Bayou Tapestry, and I don't know if you know, that's that's this huge, long, like 200 and some odd feet long um, medieval craft that was done about the, the uh, Battle of Hastings. <clears throat> and she has been asked to re reproduce that in glass <clears throat> for a small college. And there, of course, she undercut, she undercovers, she uncovers human trafficking. And Britain has had a real problem, particularly after Brexit of people being moved in as sex slaves. There was a, I think it was about three or four years ago, there was a time when they found a uh, huge semi-truck with 40 dead people in it at, you know, at the coast. Um, and then the third one takes place in France and some of the cathedrals are burning. She's there to give a talk on medieval glass and to figure out, you know, to try and work with medieval glass. And she stumbles across a body and and she's always the person of interest because she finds the body. Right. So. 
So I th I just so I fell in love with both Roz and Liam because oh, I you. felt I felt that you gave them using your word a realness. These were people that you could meet at the local diner, which they do meet at the local diner. But they're when I say everyday people, they were just everyday people. And that's always good to read. It, it can be something. I like characters that are so fantastic as well. But I felt like these were people that you would know. They would be your neighbors or they would be your friend or someone you would run into. And I thought you did such a lovely way of teasing a bit of romance with the two of them, but yet at the same time, keeping them completely individual from each other. Yeah. And there, <clears throat> there is a trace of romance in pretty much all my novels in the sense that there's uh, one of the, one of the things I like about that is that it sets up a, t a different kind of tension. Yes. Um, and that tension, I think helps, helps tell the story and move it along and also deepens the, that you look into the characters, but I agree. That's, one of the things I found out at working in newspapers is that even serial killers of all things are normal people in a sense, you know, they go to, you go to interview the neighbor. I would never have known he was such a quiet man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these, these are not extraordinarily um, large figures. They're the, the people you would meet every day and they That's have right. maybe not hidden, but they have, depth to them that you don't know so thank you i that was what i sort of set out to do and i appreciate it well i think you accomplished it quite yeah. well so i want to ask a little bit about um so we have this this town hamilton in oregon which i noticed from the notes that you created hamilton right so how as an author is it very different from creating a city or using one that is real are there pros and cons there are pros and cons. I think if you're if you're setting your story in a large city that's well known, San Francisco, L.A., um, I don't even even maybe well not you guess but you know Chicago. You you really want to be able to give the feeling of that city. But when when you're talking about somewhat small to medium towns, I think most of mine are made up, but they're based on a city that or a town that I'm familiar with. Um, and I think if you a friend of mine writes books where she sets has set a lot of them where she lives and the people all know her literally know her. they the, the chamber of commerce comes out i mean it, it, i'm not comfortable doing that i want to have a little bit of distance between where i'm talking about a town that may or may not be and the real town um and i think that there i think that there are some real positive things about it because you can put places and people there that are not there so you're not uh maligning anybody you're not maligning the businesses you're not maligning the sure. town, anything else um but at the same time you want to be able to give enough of a feel for the city that people can imagine it and i have this thing where i sort of close my eyes and go into my head which is where i live most of the time <laughs> you know, right? uh and you know and visualize where what it looks like and every single one is based on somewhere i've been you know it may not be exact but right, right. there are a lo lot of little towns up and down the oregon coast that are like hamilton and they're all they're charming they're wonderful um but none of them is exactly like that and there's not that cafe and there's not you know all those things so i like i like i guess i like making up the settings because i can i can put in there what I need to put in. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And, you know, so I, if someone has not been to the coast of Oregon, I cannot recommend it enough because I've been up and down both the East and West coast and Oregon is natural unto itself. It is not like anywhere else I've been. It is just, I mean, it's as if the mountains just tumble into the ocean and it's just so beautiful. And I, I enjoyed my time on the Oregon coast and had no idea I would like it nearly as much as I did. It's, it's, yeah, it's odd. I mean, I, I you know, I'm born in Santa Cruz for every second and spent a lot of time in, in Neville County. So I'm used to the Pacific, the edge of the Pacific. Right. But Oregon is, is different. The, the geology and the geography is slightly different. And it's just, I mean, you can walk for miles on the yes. beach there, you know, without seeing another soul. It's amazing. It is amazing. And unlike the East Coast, 
there isn't 4 million hotels and resorts right on the ocean. So it's, it really is a small town place. And, and I do think I, one of the things I was sort of struck about is because having grown up in the South, I would hear people say things like, you're not from around here, are you? And I yeah. felt like you picked up a bit of that in Oregon as well, because, you know, those people who don't live there or who didn't grow up or weren't a five generation Californian, we stick out like a sore thumb because we are different, you know, and I think that that gave your book a bit of flavor as well. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I didn't want her to be um, intrusive and I didn't want her to be naive about where she was, but she is from a big city. And mm -hmm. so she's, she, it, she does. She can't let go of a lot of that. And country life is very different than city life, no matter how we want to slice it. Yeah. I also want to talk a little bit about Patsy. Patsy was just the most lovely. <laughs> Patsy is a busybody in everybody's business and has no shame in it. And I thought, Lord, the number of Patsies I've known in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but Patsy gives us a lot of comic relief as well. I mean, she's not a fool, but yet at the same time, she does some foolish things. But exactly. that, was, that was fun. It was fun. It, it was fun writing. It was fun developing that character because I wanted to put enough of a sort of a snark into it that people would go, oh, my God, what a busybody. At the same time, she's got her heart in the right place and she she knows she knows the town. She knows the people and she's accepted and she's she's like, you know, yeah, and yeah. she's I, not she's not a pariah. She's no, just a busybody. <laughs> she's they they kind of tune around a little bit. <laughs> she's not a pariah by any means. Yeah, I have actually ducked down the aisle of a grocery store to avoid some patsies in my life. <laughs> I, I, I can understand that exactly. So Michelle, you've also written in a paranormal type of series, the Kandesky Kandesky. Right. Kandesky Vampire Series. Yeah, can, you give us, can you give the audience an overview of what those are about? Sure. Those are serious fun. <clears throat> not, not that writing the mysteries, because I've got two mystery series. Those are fun. I like that. I like the characters on it. But the Kandesky's came about because my son-in-law said, why are you writing mysteries? Write a vampire novel. You know, there's, they sell much better. I went, I've never even read a vampire novel. I have no idea. So I read some. I read some Charlene Harris. And, some, and I went, you know, these are basically romances. And I probably could write a romance. So I came up with this idea that there is a 500-year-old Hungarian vampire family that decided early on, maybe 450 years ago, that they didn't <laughs> want to kill for a living. So they started, they started, they, they went into business, basically, in medieval or, or just renaissance. Uh, Europe, and they cornered the market on some things. They would trade up and down the rivers and stuff like. That. So they became enormously wealthy. And of course, they didn't have to get they didn't they didn't pass their wealth on to anybody because they didn't have children. So by the time the book opens, they own the largest conglomerate of gossip news in the world, like Rupert Murdoch on steroids. <laughs> yeah, and, and, right. And it's called Snap is the name of that company. That's not the only company they own, but that's their sort of lodestar. And this one young woman goes to work as the managing editor of their newspaper. And what she, I mean, sorry, the magazine, the weekly magazine. It's like us or people. Mm -hmm. And she does not realize that the company is owned by vampires because, they, you know, they employ 50,000 people. However, you know, it's a massive company. And she, but she falls for the art director whose name is Jean-Louis. And they, she and John Louis get an invitation, which they can't turn down, to the Baron Kandinsky's castle in Budapest, Hungary, for this high scale meeting. And on the way there, on the company plane, John Louis turns to her and said, It's probably time I told you I'm a vampire. She runs screaming back, you know, locks herself in there. 35,000 feet over the Atlantic, she's in a plane with a vampire. Oh my God. <laughs> And it, it turns out, of course, that they have they have they have almost more money than God, and this is just this absolutely luck lavish style. I set out to write a trilogy, and I okay. don't know a trilogy. I thought it was you know I'm now working on the twelfth book in that series. That's amazing. It's, they're just they're fun, they're wry, they're not they're no there's no there there there's there's murder in there, and there is 
war in there, but it's not on the page and it's not what they do. You know, they're they still they own they still do uh, donors. They pay donors for blood. They have massive cattle ranches in in Argentina. So if, if they have that as a backup um, and the family itself, I think maybe it's around 200 people. I'm not I haven't really counted them, but, wow. you know, there's they're, then they're sort of spread all over. But it's really fun because right at the moment they're living in Kiev and we all know what's happening in Kiev. And in order for them to pursue their business interests, they need peace because they are on the lookout for anybody who's going to come and take over a vampire. Everybody's scared of vampires. So they don't live like vampires. They live like, you know, but Kiev is a real problem because they need to stop the aggression there. So they're working with NATO and the EU and all these to try and combat misinformation primarily about the Russians. So there's all kinds of weird little stuff in there that I go, you know, I'll read a, a story about something about Kiev. I bet you they could do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think sometimes, you know, I'll hear uh, interviewers ask authors, where do you get your ideas? You simply have to keep your eyes and ears open, you know? Ab absolutely. And that's where I get, you know, as you can see my office is I have post-it notes all over the place and I, you know, do cut and paste little paragraphs and stick them at the end of manuscript. Don't forget to include this fact. Um, and a prop, I know, I assume some of that comes from my newspaper background because I've always been in interested in the news, but that's, there are things that are, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction kind of thing. That's very true. That's very, <laughs> except for vampires. I've never met a vampire that I know of. Well, there you have it. There you have it. And I always tell people, you know, if you're running out of ideas, just take a trip to Florida because God knows they got some crazy people. And I was one of them for many years. So. <laughs> I had a friend in the Bay Area who'd spent years in Florida and he said, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> I, I, I will tell this because when I was moving to Los Angeles, the number of people in my family is like, oh, my gosh, you're going to the dark side. I got here and I'm like. You people have no idea what goes on in Florida. It's very obvious. Los Angeles is boring compared to Miami. It really is. I, I would kind of think so, although I, I must confess, I've only been to Florida once, and that was St. Petersburg. But just reading about it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm crazy about, oh, my God, what is her name? Well, Dave Barry, for starters. You know, all yes, of, of course. Um, and Carl Hyacin, and I can't remember the It'll come to me at three o'clock in the morning. Right. <laughs> the police reporter who worked for the for the. Yeah, oh yeah, Heather, Heather Graham. No. No, 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 oh, no, no. And I, I know who you're talking about, and yeah. I can't think of her name either. That, that's right. Anyway, but you know, reading her stuff, and of course, she comes from a background of serious reporters, very right. serious reporting. You know, you go, oh, did that really happen? Well, yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is. I do think if people really, really, really read the newspaper, they'd realize that uh, truth really is much stranger than fiction. It really is. I think so. I think so. Yeah. The and number of things that are done in the name of God. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. That, that's a whole different territory. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I think more people have in in history, probably more people have died from beliefs in some God that have yes. died in anything else, you know, which Precisely. is sad. That's sad. It's a sad commentary on humanity. It is. It is. Yeah. So um, are you, will there be a fourth in the stained glass series? There will be, there will be. Um, as I was wrapping up the third, there's a character in there who's a Surete um, Lieutenant French woman. Um, and there's, there may or may not be a little, um, interest between she and Liam. So there's some of that. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but it dawned on me that art theft is a huge problem. And I think that Liam and Roz are going to end up not working for, but working with Interpol and Surte and their art theft departments. Yeah, it's, that, it's, that'll give me a chance to tour around Europe too. That well, can I go with you? I think that'll be fun. Absolutely. Let's go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, after we, and after we win the lottery, though, I think. <laughs> now, yes. You know, I tell you, I 
I don't think any app could be more disappointing than the California lottery app that always says you're not a winner. I'm like, I have better luck with the Chinese fortune cookie. Give me a, give me a break here. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Exactly. Uh. So I know who designed this fabulous cover. It mm -hmm. was Karen Phillips, right? Yep. 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 So she's a former guest and I love her art covers. They're always so fun. She's done every one of my covers from day one. I've got a, a, a funny, I guess, Karen Phillips story. Um, she lives here, you know. And my first book was published with Purchase and Bones by a small press on the East Coast. Okay. And there was this gorgeous cover. It was, it's called Editor for Death, and it's got a bunch of Nazi stuff in it. And, all. and she, I, I loved the cover. And after the book was published, I got an email and she said, you don't know me, but my name is Karen Phelps, and I did your cover. I work for the, the press. Um, I forget what it's called now. And I just wanted to tell you it was really fun, and I live in, I think she was living in, like, Auburn, that one. Oh, my God. She used to be an uh, artist at the Sacramento Bee. I used to be an editor at the Modesto Bee. So, you know, and it turns out that this woman, whom I never knew, is this dynamite artist who lives like 30 miles away from me. And I met her through somebody in Connecticut, you know, small just, world. It, you know, some, small world. some yeah. things are meant to happen. And I love it when those things happen. I do too. I mean, that, that sort of six degrees of separation is just, is, is astounding. It is indeed. It is indeed. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me. I had such a great time. Well, thank you very much. And I, as you can tell, I pretty much love to talk and I love to talk about books. So. <laughs> Same here. You'll have to come back and we'll talk some more. I would love it. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out With Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at Dan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out with Dan.